So I hope you can all hear me well. Uh, is the microphone on? Everything okay? All right. Um, well, uh, thank you all for coming and thanks for the online audience as well as the in-person audience. Uh, thanks for your support and interest um, in the book. So what I'll do is I'll talk for about 20 minutes uh, presenting the key ideas in the book um, and then uh, Professor Hans Roth um, will lead the discussion um, with also some questions coming uh, both from the audience uh, here uh, as well as online and we'll try to coordinate as best as possible. And I will start by briefly introducing some of the key forces of disruption in healthcare before moving on to discuss how an ecosystem approach will help to mitigate some of the risks um, involved um, and then provide an example of how an ecosystem approach can uh, be implemented while paying attention at some of the uh, key collective action problems that may emerge. And I'll start with the COVID-19 pandemic, a major disruptor. It has exposed many vulnerabilities in healthcare um, across uh, the globe. It has created shortage of testing and ventilators. It has disproportionately affected um, uh, some segments of the population. And it has also led to significant burdens on the healthcare workforce. Um, it has also adversely impacted uh, the supply of pharmaceuticals across the globe. But of course, the COVID-19 pandemic was only a disruptive event that brought these problems to the surface, right? National health systems um, like the English NHS are suffering from long institutional uh, problems of, on the one hand, trying to reduce costs with uh, capital allocations, and on the other hand, um, implementing rationing decisions at the bedside um, in an attempt to provide wider coverage of healthcare services across the population. And many of these inefficiencies are due to limitations of hierarchical forms of organizing healthcare services, including bureaucratic decision making based on supply side constraints, right? And these, as we know, and as you see from uh, these um, uh, clippings from uh, the media, which are on a daily basis popping up on, on our screen, um, they are driving up the costs of treatment options, diagnostics, and hospital care. And it's quite interesting, there was a recent um, Economist article that made reference to an era of healthcare uh, services that is reminiscent of the 1930s, right? Where you had a mix uh, economy of private and charitable providers. And today the article argues patients are demanding um, for more immediate care away from the long waiting lists that the NHS is currently facing. Um, and they are willing to pay extra to get access to those services. In fact, another trend that we have observed post the COVID-19 pandemic is the increasing adoption of mobile technologies. So telemedicine in all its incarnations in the last 40 years or so, right, that has been constrained by legacy applications, non-interoperability between components and barriers to um, uh, data exchange uh, has removed a lot of those constraints uh, in order to enable doctors and patients to uh, receive a remote care away uh, from the risk of disease. And, and according to App Ani, which is an, uh, a data analytics firm, medical apps have experienced an acceleration of 65% uh, in downloads globally during the pandemic, with patients migrating to virtual consultations with their doctors. So these medical apps are disrupting um, the way primary care services uh, are delivered and empowering patients to become more active in the management of their health and wellness. And indeed, the ability to run medical applications on our smartphones has accelerated innovations for um, collecting personal health data from across the human body. And currently, there are numerous mobile applications that are available both to healthcare providers, but also to patients 
um, that help um, and, and aid uh, uh, the tracking, diagnosis, and uh, management of various physiological processes. And this is linked to efforts toward personalized medicine, right? Um, that aims at preventing disease, right? By managing each patient as a unique individual and not as an average. Patients want to be able to manage their own health and wellness on demand from the comfort of their, of, of their home with smart technologies. In addition to that, big tech companies are forcing their way into healthcare and they all have the financial power, the technical resources, and the know-how to transform the sector. And just to name a couple of examples, Amazon received drug distribution uh, licenses in over 10 US states and has also bought the online pharmacy PillPack with the ability to sell both over-the-counter and prescription drugs. And it has also started to offer virtual services to, to their own employees, right? And of course, it is the number one provider of cloud computing uh, and of generative AI applications that are very much disrupting uh, the sector. Another example, Microsoft is a key partner of Epic, right? One of the largest uh, providers of electronic medical records in the US, in addition to also being the second larger cloud provider and a key investor in generative AI. And of course you have Apple, right? With their smartwatches and more recently with their uh, X Vision Pro that are increasingly developing applications, including in healthcare. And they are disrupting um, the way uh, healthcare services um, uh, are delivered. So what I want to convey from this is that Disruption can be caused by a number of different forces, right? Including major shocks like the COVID-19 pandemic, but also by supply side constraints that um, point at the ineffectiveness and unsustainability of current practices and that pose risks to health outcomes as well as the financial viability of healthcare organizations. And on the demand side, you have new advances of medical knowledge, you have new technological innovations, and you have also pressure from patients that are empowered to make decisions about their own health and wellness. And finally, you have big tech entering the space with unparalleled scale and scope economies. So evidently disruption is systemic and digital transformation complex. And there is substantial uncertainty right, and unforeseen contingencies because of the interdependencies between different stakeholders. And these create complex uh, problems of coordination on the one hand, right? so who does what, when, and in what quantities, but also problems of cooperation. What kind of incentives do you provide to these different actors um, in order to innovate and to uh, create and capture value. And the classical remedy to problems of complex coordination um, and cooperation is vertical integration, right? Um, especially on the supply side, right? If you control the supply side hierarchically, right? Uh, then you make sure that you manage risks. And you also make sure that um, you manage possibilities of one actor or a group of actors taking advantage of others. But vertical integration may not work well when there are multiple heterogeneous complementary assets that are costly to contract, right? How do you choose from different AI workflow systems, from different electronic patient records, right? From different apps. Or when those supplying those assets have a stronger bargaining power like the big tech companies that I mentioned earlier. And even worse, when user needs are difficult to anticipate in advance, right? Um, but they only emerge in the process of delivering the services. And in such condition, innovation may be slowed down and potentially even killed because any efforts at hierarchical control may, see, may be seen as limiting or, or, or unfair by those participating. So I have already discussed how the English NHS is struggling with vertical integration 
based on supply, supply constraints, which has generated both demand for alternative options, right, but also the entry of new actors that um, are, uh, you know, aiming to address some of the shortcomings while creating new innovations. Just to spend a little bit more time on this idea of complex coordination problems and cooperation problems, what, what, what are they? Well, on the one hand, coordination problems involve interoperability challenges that arise between heterogeneous components, right? How do you make them um, uh, to work together? How do you interface them? And also coordination problems may involve challenges regarding the quality and the variety of the complements that you bring uh, uh, forward because of the heterogeneity of user needs. So such diversity can potentially compromise how well those user needs are met while delivering the required performance. And then finally, cooperation problems involve challenges in specifying the right incentives that attract but also retain um, uh, those uh, heterogeneous uh, types of providers, whether they are uh, medical providers or whether they are technical solution specialists to help manage the coordination problems that I just described. So, and this is where the key thesis of the book comes into play. The key thesis is that this complexity uh, can be mitigated and the problems can be reduced if healthcare organizations start exploring joint value propositions with one another. And in doing so, they can begin to synergistically combine resources and capabilities um, that can scale, that can have a wider scope than if trying to do everything on their own or waiting for a national uh, system to provide them, to supply them with the resources to do so. And also um, the opportunity to um, uh, exert higher levels of influence on other ecosystem actors that can have a longer term impact on digital transformation. But what is an ecosystem? And I'm, I'm trying, this is an abstract uh, figure to try to map out what could potentially look like an ecosystem. So an ecosystem is composed of multiple heterogeneous actors whose partnerships are codependent. They are codependent on capabilities and resources that they do not have, but which are essential for the joint value proposition to be realized, right? And these set of actors can combine their capabilities to create products and services whose value is greater than the sum of their separate parts. And this is the key, right? That ecosystems support open innovation from complementers that often reside in different sectors, both public and private, but also across industries, like the ones you see here on this slide. And digital platforms play a key role in this process because they provide a set of resources that can help to manage coordination and cooperation while um, uh, giving seamless and on-demand access uh, to patients on their mobile phones. Now, the key to an ecosystem approach is that these solutions to complex problems are mutually agreed upon by participant actors. And as I said earlier, the co-dependencies between them help to define the necessary incentives in relation to the cost to be incurred and value to be captured. And unlike more hierarchical forms of organizing digital transformation, in ecosystems, both the technology architecture and the governance rules um, that support the interaction between the different actors are designed as a function of the capabilities of each actor. And this is what makes an ecosystem strategically distinct, right? That they emerge through the needs and the demands, but also the capabilities of each um, actor involved. So while common standards can be used to bring those actors together, each of these actors retains some control over their resources and capabilities. And this is a key incentive for others to join, right? So the ecosystem can constantly grow 
bringing yet new services and attracting yet new users. And it is important to note that who plays the role of an ecosystem orchestrator will very much depend on the digital maturity of each actor. Not everyone can be an ecosystem orchestrator. Usually, it's someone that has control of key resources, such as a digital platform, but also that someone is responsible for enforcing the governance rules through which ecosystem participants will interact. And again, this is important because in the absence of an, uh, of an orchestrator, actors will start behaving opportunistically. Again, right? Anything goes. This is not a market. This is a managed ecosystem. And ecosystem orchestrators can vary according to the type and size of the ecosystem. So for example, a large teaching hospital can orchestrate services provided by biodata banks, machine learning experts, but also doctors, right? That can uh, predict and diagnose and also provide uh, uh, treatment options to patients. Alternatively, a network of research institutions and regulatory agencies can orchestrate the use of computational modeling and simulation. Uh, an example that perhaps we can talk about um, later during the Q&A, right? So it could be a consortium of organizations or a single organization, and the type and size will vary. The second set of actors is complementors who are the producers of services and products. And these may also vary, right? They could be um, software developers, machine learning experts. They could be also biodata banks, genomics, research institutes, and even healthcare providers and healthcare professionals. So for example, doctors on um, platforms like Doctor Care Anywhere are complementers, right? Because they provide services on demand. Um, and the third set of actors, um, namely the users, could include patients, but could also include other actors that consume those services and products. So for example, a hospital with no resident radiologists could receive services from another hospital that has extra capacity. Right? In other words, the, the roles between the complementers and the users um, could switch. Let me use one example that is discussed in depth in the book. So Siemens Healthineers is a spin-off company of Siemens that previously focused solely on the manufacturing, the selling, and servicing of medical equipment, including CT, MRI scanners, and hybrids of those. And since 2016, the company has started to focus on uh, digitally enabled uh, services built on top of medical devices. And Siemens Healthineers realized that they were connected to um, a vibrant healthcare ecosystem through a network of hospitals. And this network was producing millions of data. Right? But that data were never leveraged to their full potential. Right? So they, they were actually making more money from the medical images than the devices themselves. So they developed the Team Play digital health platform that allowed them to do two things. So first, they were now able to um, provide customized services and products for existing customers based on the data generated from the medical devices, right? And these included, for example, AI workflow systems for radiology that increased um, uh, the precision of uh, diagnostics, but also reduced the burden of work for those radiologists. And Siemens provided the infrastructure that ensured compliance um, to established interoperability standards like DICOM and HL7 while at the same time meeting privacy and security regulations like GDPR. And the second thing they did was they organized an app marketplace with third-party complementers. And there are now more than 50 applications from selected developers. And just like any other application marketplace like the Apple App Store, 
The Siemens Healthy Nears Marketplace enables third-party complementers to innovate new applications um, that can be marketed on the TeamPlay platform, both for hospitals and for diagnostic centers. And this app marketplace can thus generate value-creating interactions between these different actors, kickstarting new economies of scope and scale. And sorry for the slide I'm just giving you, and I'm not going to go through the slide, but I'm just giving you a sense of what's in the book. The book um, discusses each ecosystem actor's digital transformation problem, the key incentives to participate, and the key activities each of those actors contribute in order to realize the joint value proposition. And depending on the role and needs of each actor, these things will vary, right? So, um, for example, um, in the Siemens Healthy Nears ecosystem, Siemens provides the technological architecture, but is codependent on the hospitals um, for data and domain expertise of the radiologists, as well as the specialized solutions that are provided by the software developers, right? Um, in other words, the platform itself is just a tool, right? It only becomes valuable once the different parties start to interact, start to exchange data and knowledge that generate yet new solutions. The book also discusses the, pot the potential collective action problems that may emerge depending on the digital maturity of each actor, from coordination problems around interoperability between com um, complements to concerns over security and privacy, um, competition over pricing of services, but also a potential decrease in the quality and performance of the different services that are provided, right? And, and for each of these collective action problems, the, the book discusses possible governance mechanisms while um, providing examples um, uh, from different types of services. And again, these uh, solutions and, and, and recommended actions will vary depending on the type and scale of the ecosystem under focus. In fact, the book provides a number of different cases, uh, three extended cases, uh, one of which is Siemens Healthineers that focuses on medical diagnostics. Another one uh, on Pharma Ledger that provides a blockchain-enabled uh, platform for a number of different use cases, including electronic product identification in pharmaceutical supply chains, as well as clinical uh, 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 trials um, in uh, uh, association with biotech companies, pharmaceutical companies, as well as individual patients and LifeBit, which provides a federated learning platform for genomics research. And there's also a number of other examples, including primary care, um, patient-centered platforms like Patients Like Me and Health Unlocked, um, virtual wards that is becoming quite big uh, uh, nowadays, including in the NHS, and some examples um, with big tech uh, uh, digital um, solutions including generative AI um, in healthcare. So those are the key takeaways from the book. I do hope that you have found this uh, summary useful and relevant, and uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Hello, my name is Hannes Groff. I've already been introduced, thank you so much. Um, so here's what we're going to do. So this is going to be the Q&A and discussion part. I will have, I've brought a couple of questions. So as you've seen, I've read the book, <laughs> right? I suggest you buying it. So we have um, a big group here and we have a big group online. So, and I know that there is someone following up on the chat. So don't hesitate if you have questions or any kind of burning things, uh, burning things under your fingernails that you would like to raise. I'm going to start, okay, so. So first of all, thanks for, the, thanks for the great overview. Many of you have probably, the majority of you have, did not have the chance to read the book yet. So, um, so what you presented in the beginning was this like COVID-19 as a good example of a disruption. And there are many, many, many others as you have, as you have noted. But 
all of those are kind of complex problems, right? So, uh, so complexity in our biology that we have to understand, complexity of society that we have to understand, complexity of organizations. So that's also super complex. And now we come with ecosystems, which also are complex. So kind of my problem is now, so the, the, the question that I, that I want to raise to you is, are we solving a complex problem with a complex solution? Is that a, is that, isn't that like a, the, the inherent tension that we need to solve? That's true. Um, and uh, it's true that perhaps um, ecosystems are not easy uh, to develop. Um, and, and this is why there's a number of considerations that you, um, you need to take uh, on board. But I'll, I'll just use an example of um, a recent project. Uh, Alex is, uh, is looking at me. Alex uh, Frangi uh, is the director of the Pankhurst uh, Institute. And I, I was very fortunate to uh, be invited uh, on the proposal to develop a, a new in silico um, UK uh, pro-innovation regulation ecosystem uh, that essentially tries to build an ecosystem from the bottom up. It's emergent and uh, what's interesting is that it recognizes that there is complexity in building medical products with clinical trials as well as medical devices with a traditional approach whereby you need to run tests on humans and animals um, with all the stringent safety regulations that you have to comply with, as well as the costs and safety to humans and, and animals. And taking, taking that problem and saying, well, why are we doing it physically in the first place? Why are we not um, using computational methods in a lab that would take away a lot of that complexity um, in order to build solutions that would be more cost efficient and safe. And I think it's a great example of how it is still complex because it requires the cooperation of a number of different bodies, including academic researchers, but also regulators, uh, and of course the medical professionals and the patients, right? And providing a solution that it's, it is complex, but it's still better than the solution that we already have, um, uh, which is also potentially unsafe and costly. So, um, so to answer your question, I think, yes, it is it's a complex solution, but I think it's worth it because you're bringing together um, a number of different actors that have capabilities that no single actor has. And that's, I think, the key takeaway, right? Um, that by joining forces, uh, you can achieve greater things uh, with, with more efficiency. I and, and I don't know if Alex wants to comment on that because I, 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 I'm, I'm directly <laughs> looking at him and citing him. Uh, but the, the, the question you put in the first place, I think, is, I think if I can rephrase it in a slightly different way, is where do we, where do we know that the problem can be solved with simple solutions and is worth the effort of trying to find that simple solution as opposed to recognizing its complexity? and doing whatever it takes. And that may be a complex solution indeed. But it's, I, I don't know, you know, that would be my question as well to Panos. Is there some guidelines in terms of identifying the, that, that tipping point where years of years of years of investment to find the simple bullet that will fix this complex problem when you put all that investment on one side of the balance as opposed to dealing with the complexity right from the beginning and just, you know, buy it, by the ballots and say, well, we need to really do a big investment here, and it requires the approach that you described today. You know, how do you take that decision about where you need to go left or right? Um, is an indirect way of addressing your point, right? <laughs> yeah. No, and 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 thanks for the pushback. I I, I think um, healthcare is complex. There's no way around it. It's not a simple problem um, because there's obviously segments of the population that will never have access to 
um, um, third tier or, or fourth tier uh, services like someone that can afford them, right? And, and this is what national health systems are struggling with, that they want to improve access to services uh, across the population, but very often those services that will benefit the most, those segments of the population that need them, are too expensive for them. Sure. Um, I mean, this is historical. We know about this, right? Uh, so how do you solve this problem? Well, you start to cut uh, costs and you cut access to services in other parts of the system. And that creates imbalances. And then that tips off, right? Which is what we are experiencing now with a &E, right? No one can go to an a &E. Even people that can afford a &E. No one can access a &E anymore. So it, it's interesting that um, um, yeah, there is a tipping point, absolutely, but I think it, it will vary depending on the types of services and solutions that you're proposing. Um, but I, I, I go back even further, and that's why I started my answer to you with uh, the statement that healthcare is complex and it requires complex solutions. There's no way around it. And so one thing that kind of strikes me a little bit is so what usually happens with ecosystems, um, and I think your point about like creating an innovation ecosystem requires all these people have the different, who have like different sets of data, right? So you need to have a hospital and a pharmaceutical company and a biotech, and you need to have like, a data platform that brings them all together. Right? So you require different, very different expertise. But, but what happens with many ecosystems is that most of them are winner takes all markets. And I think you also describe it at a certain point. And if an ecosystem is a winner-takes-all market, then it actually it means like you start with this complex ecosystem, but over time it grows actually into a vertical integrated, a vertically integrated organization, right, where you have one ecosystem leader who basically makes the rule for all of them, and then and and then slowly starts vertically integrating everything. And what we see with Amazon right now actually like shows maybe also a glimpse of what 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 could happen here. So is is, is that a risk or is that maybe even something that we should like that we should look for forward to when we come to healthcare? Yeah, that's a very good point. And um, uh, you're absolutely right. If we if we compare with uh, platform ecosystems in other markets, um, that's definitely the case. And in fact, um, in commercial ecosystems, we see that the more mature they become, the bigger they become, um, the more they start to control. Um, innovation in order to increase their value capture opportunities. Um, but I think in the context of healthcare, and this I think will, will remain uh, a problem, especially in the private sector, right? Because um, companies in the private sector want to make uh, money and they want to increase their profit, right? So this will never stop. But I think in the context of public health <laughs> service, um, given that uh, healthcare is a public good, I think there are opportunities to um, put in place policies and regulations that um, stop uh, uh, the possibility of uh, or mitigate the possibility um, of these platforms becoming too big. Um, so an approach uh, to do that would be to, I think uh, a very good example of this is the Pharma Ledger um, example that is mentioned in the book that is um, a non-profit organization that brings together these different bodies and acts as a governing body uh, that makes sure that regulations are met and the patient is served first and foremost. Um, now, again, I'm coming back to the point that private companies will all, always try to make a profit and they will always try to increase their value capture opportunities. There's no, there's no denying that. But I think if you have an independent non-profit organization that could also involve the government overseeing some of the activities, and there are technological solutions around that, like the one uh, um, uh, described in the book, um, I think there are ways of mitigating some of the risks involved. I think we have a question back there. So, yeah. we'll so Panos, uh, Andrew James, Professor of Innovation Management and Policy at the Business School. 
Um, my question is about implementation in the National Health Service. Mm -hmm. So the NHS has a far from stellar record in introducing new technology. So if you think about the the long running saga with uh, with GP patient records, for instance. Mm -hmm. So I, I wonder, given that this is a, a whole scale uh, transformation of of the NHS, whether the fact that it's digital makes it any different to previous experiences with with technology in the NHS, and if it doesn't, are there any solutions that you could see to actually expedite uh, implementation? Yeah. Um, first of all, let me just say that I'm not proposing a wholesale transformation of the NHS. <laughs> Um, uh, what I am proposing is that um, we can implement policy changes that would allow NHS hospitals to um, uh, be more flexible in their partnerships with private actors, um, as well as uh, uh, public sector organizations. I think it's, it's important to, uh, in order to enable the kind of innovation that I described, that um, hospitals are not... Um, constrained uh, by decisions that are made um, centrally, right? They should be allowed to make some decisions on their own uh, and to uh, even form their own ecosystems within the NHS, right? Uh, why shouldn't that be possible? Why should they depend on solutions that are imposed to them um, centrally? And also capital allocations that are imposed on them centrally. Um, I think various governments have proposed performance-based approaches to allowing hospitals to become more independent, but I think we need, we need a little bit more than that um, in allowing them to form partnerships uh, with actors that would benefit them the most. And each hospital is different. No hospital is the same. Uh, I think that's the important message that I want to uh, convey through the book. We do have one question online. Uh, yeah, we've got a couple actually, Panos. But um, so Dimitri asks, uh, Dimitri asks, how far are we from the picture that you described in your presentation? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think um, again uh, there are um, cases that are also reported in the book of hospitals um, within the NHS that um, are making strides into. Uh, transforming themselves and becoming more ecosystem oriented. Um, I'm very fortunate to have my brother um, in the audience uh, without, without putting him on the spot. Uh, but there, um, Bart's, I think, hospital is, is, is one exemplar. Um, it manages four different uh, uh, hospitals and is partnering with a number of different uh, technology providers um, uh, to transform how services are delivered um, to their patient population. And so uh, I, I think there are examples that we can draw from uh, that allow us to um, uh, generalize to, to the broader uh, hospital population within the NHS. But obviously, like I said, each hospital is different and needs to be uh, approached uh, accordingly. So before we go to the next question online, I have, I have, I have one question because I would like to, to turn one, one topic on that is an underlying theme and, and you refer to it quite a lot in the book, uh, which, is, which is trust. Mm -hmm. So when you say we need an ecosystem approach and an ecosystem approach means we have like a joint value, it requires trust that I think everybody has also the same value like I do. And the problem is, like outside of our organization, sometimes even within my own organization, I don't know whether everybody shares the same kind of mm -hmm. uh, value proposition. So what strikes me a little bit, the way that it comes up here in the book is you basically multiple times, I'm um, also in the, in the, in the, in the, in the blockchain um, example, you stress the point that, well, we have now more digital technologies, they create data, and that helps us control each other. Right? So basically now we have more ways in controlling each other, and this is the way that we produce trust. So is this, is this the right way of taking it? 
No, I, 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 I don't think I'm making that argument. And uh, um, I'm sorry that you, you have that impression. I think um, data is absolutely important um, when it comes to digital transformation because I think data can allow you to customize um, solutions um, um, to different needs. Uh, but it also allows you to learn uh, about uh, new needs that are latent, right? And, and allows you to build new services. So when it comes to the value proposition, I think what's important is that obviously um, there is a joint value proposition to make something work. Like in the Siemens Healthy Nears example, you want to make the team play platform uh, work because if, if everyone is satisfied with the types of services that are being offered, then uh, there are potentially more interactions between both the hospitals and the technology providers, right? To, to develop yet new solutions. But that doesn't mean that everyone has the same, aspires to have the same value uh, or capture the same value from the ecosystem, right? So just to give an example, the radiologist is happy to have this AI workflow system helping them uh, better understand an area in an MRI scan that is unrecognizable to them, right? That, that they cannot decipher. And, and the AI workflow system is in a position to uh, sift through multiple data points and to give them recommendation of what that could potentially be, right? So for the radiologist, the value lies in better interpretation, right? But for the hospital, potentially, is about maximizing throughput, <laughs> right? And potentially uh, minimizing the workload for individual radiologists, right? And so on and so forth. For the developers, obviously, um, improving their solutions and selling them on multiple marketplaces, that's their uh, aspired value. So I don't think there is one single value for everyone, but there's a joint value proposition to make the platform work because that will satisfy each actor's individual uh, uh, needs. Um, so uh, now trust is a, is a whole new different dimension that uh, perhaps we can uh, discuss with, with another question. We do have already a couple of questions now in the room, so maybe so we start right over there. one here and one for Ken that I know of. Oh, lot. <laughs> get through many quick questions. That's good. Right. So you've outlined the case for a, an ecosystem approach at kind of primary, secondary level nicely. Um, how would you apply this to kind of preventative care? So reducing inequalities and, and engaging with people before they're actually in the, the traditional healthcare system? Yeah, I mean... We discussed this uh, uh, before the beginning of the talk that um, there is definitely a trend towards preventative uh, medicine. And I think at this point, a lot of the solutions um, target, um, I would say, uh, people that are more health conscious uh, um, and are willing to use a number of different devices to monitor their health and wellness. Um, I think a lot of the solutions are currently expensive for the larger population, including um, things like genomic testing um, for birth uh, 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 defects or uh, birth complications um, in newborns or even um, babies that have not been born yet. In some countries, you would be surprised the cost is quite low. But in this country, for, for some reason, the costs are quite high. And it's not something that is in our mindset to implement upfront, even though it could save a lot of costs uh, for the NHS and actually improve the management um, of, uh, in this case, um, uh, birth and, and, and the management of children as they grow up. And, and you have to do it as early as birth. There's no other way around it. Prevention has to happen at birth. It can happen when you're 50 or 75. So even, even though, like I said, there is a trend with people 
monitoring their health and fitness. Um, there's, a, uh, there's, there's quite a strong trend on this, but I think it has to happen before that. Um, and, and it requires policy changes because I think the, the solutions could be made more cost effective and cost efficient. And obviously it requires a lot of changes, right? So you like change from a disease-based system to a prevention-based system, yeah. right? Which uh, I think none of the health system really are built that way at, at the no, moment. No, no. So that's a little, bit, a little bit difficult. But I think maybe like just to piggyback, I think like 23 and me showed it quite well, right? A couple of years ago, many, many got a Christmas gift like you have to spit in that tube and then you can send it to 23andMe. And then if you happen to be in the United States, you get a health report. And it was like 200, what was it, like $200 or something. Um, I don't know about the quality of the health reports actually, but there was like a huge demand. So um, as soon as we lower down the costs and sequencing costs have decreased quite a lot, like quite a lot. Um, now we are more in the hundreds. Um, so, and we used to be in the thousands and even much more. I mean, we have to be happening in the billions. Of the, 20 years ago, so so that's that's quite impressive. But there were no more questions over there. So the, the previous question is exactly the one that was in my mind, specifically because we're in Manchester, and I'm trying to I'm trying to think about the, the vision that you've outlined here being applied to health inequalities in Manchester, and what the impact uh, might be. And it was precisely this point that does it does it then mean that um, you know access to, to health um, and, and well-being uh, becomes um, related to your ability to consume and your, your ability to, to pay for that. And then also to, to, the, to the question I think um, uh, Hans posed at the beginning, if it's about the role of um, companies in value extraction, Mm -hmm. then does that accentuate those problems and mean that um, you know, it's going to be those particular areas with the highest opportunity for value extraction that becomes the places where the ecosystem works most effectively, but then the places that's least accessible to those that can't afford it? Yeah, and, and there's always a risk, but I think this is important, again, in the context of Manchester and in the context of all the health innovation ecosystems that are being built, I think we as researchers have an important role to play uh, with more R&D um, to bring down the costs and improve um, uh, the wide, uh, wider access to these types of services to the, to the population without necessarily increasing the risks that um, uh, big actors um, will try to take advantage of this because there's a, the, the, there's a greater uh, value capture opportunity. Um, I also wanted to say something else, but now I, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> so maybe we move on to the next question. So you're sitting out on a hot chair. Either. Yeah, it's a, I'm being bombarded. And I'm really thanks sorry. for the, the tough <laughs> questions, by the way. Uh, maybe tomorrow I'm being pulled into, into Parliament. To, to, uh... <laughs> um, I'm not going to make it easier for you. Yeah. Um, but it's a follow-on question, actually, in a similar direction. So also because we've discussed about uh, data-driven innovation. Yeah. And um, of course, uh, when we innovate based on data and the data that we currently have, and this is going to be very important for digital transformation, then we know that it's very inequitable and very, very heavily biased, particularly in, in healthcare. Um, and I work in a data analytics business and um, I see it on a daily basis that we make decisions, as you said, that are based on revenue generation. Um, where do you get the biggest amount of money and um, what do you need to input to deliver on, on a certain project? And what we input is data that is definitely not reflective of the um, general demographic and doesn't reflect anything that is remotely close to representing, um, like I would say, a population on a national level. So we're innovating on heavily biased data and we do that as researchers as well, right? When I still worked in, in research, I used, um, I reused data that was previously generated for a very specific context and then reused it for my context and again, probably introduced a lot of bias. So we're, mm -hmm. we're generating um, new devices on biased data. We're transforming our healthcare system on very biased data. How 
Does that ecosystem approach not really amplify all these inequalities rather than mitigate them? Yeah, I mean, the quality of data is a big issue, and I think there's no such thing as unbiased data. I don't believe there is, because it comes down to our own biases and the way we train systems. Uh, the, the people that train the systems are already uh, full of biases, so they are already training the systems with their own biases. Right? So there's no such thing as unbiased data. Now, um, can we mitigate that? Absolutely. And I think um, this is where I think the power of the ecosystem comes into play. Because it, if there's a single actor producing the data, then you can expect that that data is going to be full of the biases and myopias inherent in that organization. Where, whereas, and it's a little bit of, I mean, those of you who are into adversarial networks, I think it's, it's a little bit of how adversarial networks work, right? That you have an adversary now coming in and say, well, wait a minute, that's bias, let's change it. So the, the, the more partners you have, uh, the more scrutiny the data will be exposed to, right? That, that doesn't necessarily mean that biases are going to go away, but there's going to be more scrutiny as to the kinds of biases that are already there. And also, since you allow more complementers in, you will have more data. I mean, you, you had the COVID data platform, right? So the, the idea was you create a federated learning environment where you actually ask France providing some data and Germany and the United Kingdom. All right. So we have, if we have all these countries together, we maybe produce a data set that is actually much better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's technically then suddenly possible, right? So while if everybody just sticks to their own, then we have reproduced biases. I think there is a question. Yes. Ooh, the pressure. <laughs> Thank More you pressure? for the presentation. Um, so things, of course, do go wrong in healthcare. Um, and when things go wrong, uh, the concept of accountability in medical legal world is, is often useful to arbitrate and dispute what happens how do you see accountability changing in an ecosystem world for healthcare yeah I, I will be a little bit provocative i will say that every day all of us share personal data on our personal devices and we don't think twice and I, i've had this conversation actually with some of my executive students that are coming from healthcare um, it's impressive how when you want to do a clinical trial or when you want to um, go for an application for a medical device of some sort, there's all this scrutiny and regulation that you have to go through. And, and then when you leave that and you go outside, uh, immediately you start sending things on your mobile phone and sharing things, your location and what you ate and what you did this and what you did that. You have... Uh, personal devices that um, uh, measure your blood glucose and your oxygen levels, et cetera, et cetera. Where do all these data go, right? To Apple, to Google, and, and everyone else. Um, so uh, what I'm trying to say is that our perception um, of uh, privacy and security of data, I think, is, is, um, is conflated or confused. Uh, when it comes to um, different types of activities that we carry on, on our own, uh, with no other help, <laughs> right? We're, we're doing this on our own. No one is forcing us to do it, right? Um, um, so I think we need to rethink the way that um, we scrutinize also for um, uh, innovative products. Um, we, were, we were having the conversation earlier that electronic patient records are uh, are considered to be uh, medical devices um, in some uh, regions and therefore have to uh, um, under, be, uh, go, uh, undergo um, regulation, right? Um, but again, compare that to what's happening in reality in, in hospitals and the way patient records are handled um, and, and, and whether they are scrutinized as medical devices, right? So I, I think... I think there is in, an imbalance into how we think about things and how we, we actually do things uh, with our data. Um, at the end of the day, I think patients want to have access to their data and they want to have the, that data on their personal devices and do whatever they want with that. 
and that's where sh regulation should focus, right? On the patient, not on the innovators. <laughs> I think that's my, that's my view. I think the patients should be responsible for their data and they should be regulated for it. Um, and they should provide consent as to how their data should be used. Um, and, and I think that's a starting point. That's not the solution, uh, but that's a starting point. I think that was a, that was a great final word. Um, we are very, at the very end of, um, of today's q and day. I just have to say, we, cr we scratched the surface. There are still uh, quite some topics that we didn't c uh, capture, that we didn't cover here, like digital maturity, we barely discussed. We also barely discussed like co-innovation uh, co risk, which is another fabulous topic that I uh, like very much. Um, go and look into the book. Um, there are quite some, some great cases. You have seen a few of them, so uh, I politely do the advertisement for you, so you don't have to do it. <laughs> um, no, thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much for coming. Please keep the conversation going. You can probably do it at other venues and also online, I assume. So, yeah. and then I leave the rest last spot for you. <laughs> well, thank you, Hans, for being such a great facilitator and um, for being so positive and, and supportive. And uh, thank you all for the tough questions. Uh, I hope that some of my answers were satisfactory. Um, I, I know these are tough questions and, and I don't think we can solve them with a book. So thank you for coming. Mm -hmm.